everyone. Welcome to today's broadcast. This webinar is being brought to you by the Northeast Wind Resource Center. And to begin with, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. Today, all of our participants will be in listen-only mode throughout the broadcast, so we will not be able to hear you. You can connect to the audio portion of this webinar using your computer, mic, and speakers, or a headset, or you can listen in via telephone. We do recommend that you listen in using your computer to avoid telephone charges. But if you are listening to us today by phone, we ask that you please enter the audio pin into your telephone keypad. This will allow us to keep track of you throughout the broadcast. And today we are encouraging all of our webinar participants to please type your questions into the question box on your webinar console as you think of them. You can do this at any time during today's broadcast and we will queue your questions up and answer them at the end of the presentations as time allows. So again, type your questions in as you think of them. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar as well as slides from this webinar in the Northeast Wind Resource Center resource library on the web address you see on your screen. And with that, I would like to introduce Val Story. Val is the Offshore Wind Project Director for Clean Energy Group and the Northeast Wind Resource Center. Val, please go ahead. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, everyone, for joining us, and especially to Megan and Earl for giving two presentations. Today's webinar topic is on training a domestic skilled workforce to support the development of a U.S. offshore wind industry. As Sam, whoops, excuse me, I went a little too far. There we go. As Sam mentioned, this webinar is brought to you by the Northeast Wind Resource Center, which is one of the six U.S. Department of Energy supported wind energy regional resource centers in the U.S. Earlier this year, DOE announced funding for six regional centers. You can see them up on your slide now. These six centers serve their regions as wind energy information centers and work collaboratively with local organizations and try to engage as diverse stakeholder as diverse stakeholder groups as possible. The centers are focused on land-based wind, offshore wind, and distributed wind. Some focus on a particular wind sector more so than others, but the three wind sectors are pretty well covered across the states. We are working to provide accurate and fact-based information about wind in efforts to overcome and mitigate challenges. We work with policy and decision makers and we try to ensure that leaders have the tools they need to make informed decisions about wind, wind siting, and wind-related policies. The Clean Energy Group is administering the Northeast Wind Resource Center, and we are doing so in partnership with Sustainable Energy Advantage and the Maine Ocean and Wind Industry Initiative. The NWRC, as it's known, is focused both on land-based and offshore wind energy. The organization I work for, Clean Energy Group, we are a leading nonprofit and we work across the U.S. and internationally on clean energy technology, clean energy finance, and policy. We are focused on the offshore wind aspect for the Resource Center and we are working with policymakers trying to advance state policy and see if we can work together collaboratively for regional policies to support the development of this industry. So, on to today's webinars. We have two guest speakers. Earl Walker is the Head of Training and Development for Siemens Energy, and Megan Ansler is the Executive Director for Self-Reliance. Uh, the offshore wind industry, as you know and as you've likely heard, holds, holds the potential for great economic and employment benefits. But what are we doing to train our workforce to get ready for this upcoming and nascent industry. In order to prepare the workforce for participation in offshore wind, training practices, training standards, and certifications are needed. And both of today's panelists are engaged in preparing and working and certifying U.S. workers primarily in health and safety, both onshore and offshore. We'll also learn a little bit about what the health and safety standards are in Europe and globally, and what opportunities there are for collaboration and for transferring lessons from Europe. 
as many of you know, Cape Wind is likely to put steel in the water in 2015. And what will their workforce look like? What are the employment opportunities for the U.S.? And how trained will our workforce be? These are all some of the questions we'll be looking to address today. So with that, I would like to introduce Earl Walker. He will give the first presentation. Since 2011, Earl Walker has been the head of training and development in the Energy Service Division of Siemens Energy. He holds the responsibility for the technical and development training of employees in both wind service and new unit installation in North and South America. And prior to this position, he held various positions within Siemens. He is a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Navy Submarine Force. He retired from active duty in 2001. Earl received his AS in nuclear engineering technology from Excelsior College and a BS in business administration from the University of Phoenix. Earl, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Val. That was a nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the training aspects of what you can expect, whether you're doing onshore or offshore turbine installation and service uh, in, in your areas. The, the difference is are not as great as you might believe. Uh, there's a there's a there's a, a cadre of training that must be conducted if someone's going to work at height around a uh, power plant because it's not it's really a, a wind turbine is nothing more than a small power plant uh, suspended about 300 feet in the air. There's a little bit extra that has to go on because one is working offshore. And in in, in most cases, uh, I'm going to let uh, Megan speak to that. Uh, because that's offshore training and specifically to uh, sea survival and boat transfers. But uh, most of what we're going to talk about is, is really just about wind in, in, in general. I've been asked on a number of occasions, what can our community do to prepare for this? And, and generally the answer, from at least from Siemens' perspective, is, is good community colleges with good programs in electrical and hydraulic systems that, that Siemens can pull from in the local area. Uh, we, we really want to pull people from the local area to support these jobs because they're, they're used to the areas. Uh, when we first started putting uh, wind turbines in across the United States uh, several years ago, there wasn't many uh, trained individuals who could do that. And so we were relocating people from a few schools who did. Uh, and that's somewhat problematic. So we took a, a lot of really sharp folks out of uh, Detroit from the Michigan Institute of Aviation Technology, then took them out west to places like uh, Goldenrod or Goldendale, Washington, or or Sweetwater, Texas, and they really weren't prepared for the rural lifestyle that they had to support. So from Siemens' perspective, it's much better to hire from the local area because uh, folks have roots in that area. So. Uh, what I'm going to talk about here in the next few minutes is the kind of training we do, and I think you can get an idea of what uh, one might do to uh, uh, prepare for that. Let's see. All right. Now, jurisdictions. I'm, I'm going to go over this very, very briefly, but uh, when you're we're preparing a training program, you need to understand who's got the, the, the power to, to make rules in your area. He's got the safety rules, the technical rules, the transportation rules, etc. And uh, as a time, at least I put this slide together, these were some of the agencies we had to consider. Uh, anything where you had uh, transportation, it's going to the United States Coast Guard and the Bureau of Energy Management for actual installation and working offshore. And as you, you move inshore less than three miles, it, it uh, became the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. So there's several different jurisdictions one has to concern themselves with. The last uh, information I had was that uh, the, uh, the rules working offshore were not going to change dramatically from those working onshore. So we can expect some of the same rules we have from OSHA to be, uh, to be used. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Global Wind Organization. Uh, this was put together a few years ago. Uh, with a consortium of OEMs and energy uh, producers, as well as some, uh, some uh, other agencies that had a vested, vested interest in ensuring that the wind program was safe uh, across the world. And to make sure that uh, everyone had the same types of training, 
because in reality it, it shouldn't be much different whether one's working for Siemens or Suzlon or working for Dong Energy or Duke Energy. It should be kind of a similar thing. So a number of standards were put together to try to make sure that the safety of our, our technicians was uh, paramount. And so things that uh, were looked at, of course, were national legislation, things from the last slide. Who, who, who has the rulemaking uh, abilities and what are the rules? Then there was industry best practices, things we thought we could do uh, well within the industry. And together they come up to make the GWO standards or the Global Wind Organization standards. Now the standards themselves are, are, are not law. If, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, working in a fire alarms or building construction, you have the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. That's not law in itself. It's just a, a bunch of good ideas that people put together in a book, uh, and it doesn't have the uh, force of law until a local community votes it in as part of their of their policy. Well, GWO is the same way. It's not law, uh, but if the organizations follow the rules, we feel confident that. Uh, that you get a good safety product out and your, your technicians are well well trained to, to react in case of an emergency. You can see on the bottom of the slide some of the uh, the companies have signed on to it. All the major manufacturers, OEMs, have signed on to GWO. Uh, one can go to the GWO website, and I'm sure if you Google something like uh, Global Wind Organization, uh, by the way, it's uh, it's uh, European instead of U.S., so there's an S in organization instead of a Z. But you, pl you plug that in, and you, you can pull down the standards. And if you're a community college or you're a trade school and you want to know what it is that I need to do to prepare for GWO, well, the answer is right there. And it's completely free for you to download that information. And you can set up a, you can set up a program and have it independently audited. And if you meet those requirements, you're now a GWO organization. So the training is going to fall uh, from GWO in, into these types of uh, categories. Uh, there's working at heights. That's, that's the ability to climb a tower safely, wear the harnesses safely, and do rescues for people uh, in case of an emergency. You can see the picture on the right there. There's a gentleman uh, uh, is about to do an escape from a uh, three megawatt direct drive turbine in Denmark. You can see the harness and the types of equipment that he has to wear. All of that's covered in the GWO Working Heights. It's about a two-day class, and it's, uh, it's pretty intense. There's also GWO First Aid, which is very similar to the other First Aid classes taught around the world, but it does have a turbine-specific uh, uh, focus. That way uh, people are not learning just uh, general first aid tips. It's things one would, might encounter in the turbine. Uh, GWO Manual Handling is, is how to pick up things, how to... Uh, do it without uh, you know, throwing one's back out or your shoulder or things like that in the limited confines of a wind turbine generator. GWO Fire Awareness uh, teaches the student how to react in case of a major fire emergency uh, up tower. And, uh, in general cases, by the way, if you want the short answer, it's run away. Uh, but uh, we do teach them some basic firefighting skills uh, in case uh, it's required. GWOC survival, uh, I'm going to let uh, Megan speak more on that because that's definitely in her, uh, her arena right there. Uh, but that's, of course, necessary for, for working offshore that we don't have to do uh, onshore terms. Everything on this page is onshore and offshore, by the way, with exception of sea survival, which is offshore only. Regional compliance or OSHA 10, this is basic... Uh, uh, industry uh, safety requirements, lockout, tagout, that kind of thing. Uh, technical safety is, of course, we teach that teaches our students uh, how to put the tower in a safe condition prior to doing work on the on the turbine. Uh, driver safety. Uh, we added this to our curriculum a few years ago because we noted a lot of our technicians were having uh, accidents on their way to work, and interestingly, uh, it was uh, generally the, gen the wildlife in the area that was taking the brunt of this, uh, deer specifically. Uh, we started providing this training and noticed that our accident rates dropped off pretty dramatically, so we made it a uh, mandatory requirement for anyone driving a Siemens vehicle. Advanced Rescue is something that we teach. It's a, it's a five-day long course that teaches students how to do rescues uh, in a more uh, detailed way, uh, whereas in GWO working at heights is how to put on a harness, how to climb, and how to do basic rescues to get someone down tower. Advanced rescue makes the assumption that people are working in the, in the, uh, the turbine. Uh, they may not have their harnesses on because if you're up there, it's not required, and then they have some type of emergency. So 
teams are trained how to get them back into their harness, get them on a backboard, and get them out of that turbine, either up or down, depending on the location. Uh, and for what I'm trying to get some sand is generally if you're on shore, you're going to rescue down. You're going to take the person from the turbine, put them on the ground, get EMS to take them out to the hospital. But if you're offshore, that very, that very well may be a helicopter coming to do that rescue. So uh, we, we teach the students all the techniques necessary to do uh, rescues in any turbine type in any place. Uh, then uh, if an emergency occurs, they can choose the right uh, techniques to use. And the last one's blade and hub rescue. If you work inside the blades, which are hollow, if you're doing inspections or if you're doing repairs, uh, there are special techniques necessary to do rescues from there, and so uh, we provide this training as well. All of these things here we do uh, here in our, our Orlando offices. We also provide this training in Newcastle, England, Branda, Denmark, and Bremen, Germany. Uh, we don't do the sea survival in Orlando. Uh, in fact, uh, Megan's uh, company we're looking very strong at is uh, someone who's going to provide that training for us. It's just not in our our, our skill set here, so we'll find somebody whose uh, skill set it is in. Now, that was all the technical training. There's also a, a, obviously some technical training that's needed. <clears throat> Bolt torque and tensioning, these, these towers are put together with thousands of bolts, and you have to check the, 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 the torque specification on those on an annual basis. Uh, they're also tensioned. Uh, and the difference between torquing and tension is uh, uh, tensioning, you're actually stretching the stud uh, with a hydraulic uh, press and uh, snugging down the, the nut. Uh, it's a kind of a dangerous evolution, so we need to make sure technicians know exactly what they're doing when they do that. Cable makeup and repair, electrohydraulics, uh, understanding how the hydraulic systems and electrical systems correspond inside the, the turbine. Uh, operations and maintenance, uh, it says it's platform specific. That what, what that means is for the 2.3 variable speed, it's a different class than the 3.0 direct drive or the 3.6 variable speed or the 6.0 direct drive. So whatever the platform type is, a turbine type, we have a different training class for each one. And that's also true of troubleshooting uh, and later on advanced troubleshooting. So those are some of the, the technical trainings uh, that we provide. And we'd like to use real hands-on equipment wherever possible and supplement that with 3D uh, computer simulation models. It takes away a little of the worry about uh, working around energized electrical equipment. Uh, like as I said, most of that training we can do here in Orlando. There's a, there's a lovely picture of two of our wind turbine generators uh, sitting in our building here in Orlando, with the exception of the uh, the uh, sea survival, which uh, will be done either on site or in a location that has a very large swimming pool. And uh, that's uh, what I have for a presentation. Thank you, Earl. We will save questions for the end, but just a reminder to folks to please use the chat box to type in any questions for the presenters, and we will get to them at the end of the hour. So next, I would like to introduce Megan Amsler. Since 2001, Megan has been the Executive Director of Self-Reliance, a nonprofit organization providing high-quality energy education to all types of consumers and industry professionals. She's involved in workforce training in the clean energy sector, and since 2010, she's been working to establish the first hands-on technical offshore renewable energy training center in North America. The North Atlantic Offshore Renewable Training and Development Center will provide technical and health and safety training for offshore renewable energy workers beginning in 2015. Megan is a member of the Collaborative Ocean Readiness. She was the chair of the Falmouth Energy Committee for 13 years, and she's the treasurer of the Cape and Islands Renewable Energy Collaborative. She's also a member of the board of directors of the Small Wind Certification Council and the Housing Assistance Corporation. She's an adjunct, adjunct faculty member at Cape Cod Community College, where she's been teaching renewable energy since 2007. So next up is Megan Amsler. Thank, Thank you, you Megan. Sure. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ocean readiness and what we are doing uh, for training through the North Atlantic Offshore Renewable Training and Development Center. Um, ocean readiness, just to give you a quick overview, is a collaboration, um, sort of a partnership of four individuals. We have myself, 
and working with Ron Beck, who is former Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard for offshore renewable safety. Um, Tanya Maynard, who is an environmental health and safety expert. She works for Two Sud CMSS America. And Joel Whitman, who is with Whitman Consulting Group that has a global reputation for cable installation. So we feel like we have a really good team um, put together to look at uh, really looking at the entire risk assessment, and I'm going to move my slides on here so we can hopefully see that. Next. There we go. So, oh, come back. So, for our team, we really have this, these four blocks of, of expertise for looking at offshore health and safety standards, workforce development for both on and offshore, um, and then looking at the specific project installation issues for offshore. Um, and then for the maritime regulatory space, that is that is something else that we offer. And from the services perspective, you can see we um, do everything from community, helping with community outreach, general uh, advising, and then risk identification for project specific. We definitely feel that there is a, a need. Clearly, we don't have any steel in the water as of yet in the United States, but there are projects that are um, on deck and ready to get in in the water. Hopefully, summer of 2015, we will start to see some um, some action for both deep water as well as for Cape Wind projects. But here's a list just to basically show that we have we have lots of things um, potential for lots of projects to, to come online. And in January, just a couple weeks, we will have a pretty large auction for an area south of Martha's Vineyard. And we're pretty excited about the, the four gigawatts of capacity that will hopefully get built out there. Um, but everything from you know the eastern seaboard, looking also out to the Pacific Northwest, and the deep water installations that um, that we hope to come online as well uh, out there. So definitely a need for health and safety training and and really looking at um, the technical capacity uh, and preparing the workforce so that we have. Americans on these first couple of jobs because it would not be okay for us to have zero Americans on these jobs. And I think everybody who's interested in the industry um, and seeing it successful uh, from the right out of the gate would, I would agree with that. Um, so why do we need a, a, a well-trained workforce? Well, we obviously do not have the time to to learn the lessons um, the hard way, and we, we would like to make sure that we're providing training that is of the highest caliber, and really looking to the best standard. Um, as was mentioned previously, the regulations here in the United States, um, they're not so comprehensive as, as some of the other um, places in Europe, as we see, um, having done some fair amount of research into the, what the legislation and best practices are. We feel that it's a really good thing to look to the experts in Europe who have been doing this way longer than we have and, and bring over best practices here. Um, as Earl mentioned, looking to the Global Wind Organization for those um, basic safety standards and obviously trying to strive for uh, beyond that. When we have um, a checklist, which is what we have through the bone Bessie process here in the United States, um, the safety management system, there are opportunities for just checking a box. And, and our, our perspective from ocean readiness is to really be sure that we have, um, we have a different culture that is developing here that, that is about being prepared for um, worst, <laughs> the worst case scenario and, and being prepared for that and making sure that, that we don't have, um, that we don't have accidents, that it's really working under zero harm. So our idea is to uh, also work with turbine manufacturers and, and to be sure that all of the requirements are met for the, the trainees that are going to be going out into the, um, into the offshore sector. Uh, really looking at how, how are decisions made for a go, no-go uh, call when working in an offshore environment, in particular in New England, where we've got all kinds of crazy weather situations that happen uh, pretty quickly. Um, so that's also part of the risk assessment process hope to support. Um, for the risk assessment, we really want to look at this from soup to nuts, looking at um, everything from the cable installation, the vessel activities, foundation, turbine installation, so you know that whole part of construction, 
uh, and then looking at how do we how do we walk uh, say the iron workers or another union that is interested in, in being part of the construction process of a particular project, how do we walk them through uh, what they need for minimum requirements from a training perspective, um, best practices, and, and be sure that we know what their um, existing, let's say, experience and certifications are, and then help them identify what they need to fill in those gaps so that they are ready to go and, and work on these, on these jobs. Also looking at the, as I mentioned before, what the applicable maritime regulations are, and, and Earl had a nice little visual there, so you could see, you know, within three nautical miles, uh, we're looking at, you know, state water and OSHA and, and domestic local um, regulations, and then beyond that, we're looking at the federal, um, at the federal regulations for that. Uh, again, just sort of wanting to walk through work, um, worker health and safety. The, uh, as, as Earl mentioned, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, they are in charge of the Outer Continental Shelf. Uh, BESI, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, they're also involved in the Outer Continental Shelf. OSHA, and they also, that applies to the land-based sector as well. Um, and then the Coast Guard, for anyone who's going to be making a transition from the quayside out to the turbines, uh, we have U.S. Coast Guard regulations that need to be followed, and clearly all of the vessels need to be um, working to those standards as well as the, the vessel crews. And then I'm going to talk in a few minutes about the, um, the sea survival piece of GWO and, and vessel transfer and how important that is. Through ocean readiness, we are also interested in making sure that we have back deck workers as well as below the water workers that are trained up and uh, you know from remote operated, remotely operated vehicles, um, divers and cable installation workers. You know this question of the limited window of opportunity that we have for construction, which is uh, dictated by the federal regulations. Um, how are we going to staff those? 24-hour work cycles and make sure that everyone is has current certifications and that there's no uh, there's no issue out there in terms of putting anyone at risk if, if there are uncertified uh, workers and and wanting to make sure that that's absolutely uh, meticulously monitored and and then obviously as we look at training folks up for this industry and acknowledging full well that there are two projects on deck. And then after that, so we sort of get into the into the calm waters for a few years. And I think the important piece to recognize here is that when we have Americans trained up and ready to go with the Global Wind Organization standards um, and certifications in their hands, they actually become uh, able to go and work in the global marketplace and, and to gain more experience if they so choose to go and and work in some of the projects. They could go and work in the UK and Germany, lots of places where they could go and, uh, and continue to work on, uh, on offshore wind projects, and then come back to the US and, and work here when we have some more projects up and ready to go. I sort of spoke to this zero harm. That's basically just what we're interested in doing here um, through the North Atlantic Offshore Renewable. Training and Development Center is to really make sure that we have the best curriculum and the best training programs available to our workers so that they are going to be following zero harm principles in the workplace. Um, we are working, we are very lucky to be working with the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. We have a, an MOU in place with them. Um, and, and as Earl earlier went through the five modules of GWO, the, um, the idea here is to make sure, because I should note that there are really only two places in the United States where you can get four of the five GWO modules, uh, one of them being the Siemens facility in Orlando, and then there's another one uh, in the Midwest. So our idea is to, to make a one-stop shop for all five modules, and clearly, if you want to work in the offshore space, you need to have the sea survival component and um, be well-trained in doing the transfer vessel. So Mass Maritime has instructors already that teach, they teach the STCW um, 
certification programs. They do first aid and many other things that are really a nice fit for us in terms of getting good instructors. And they also happen to be perfectly located on Southern Bay. And that offers us a nice opportunity to uh, install a, a transition, a tower transition piece uh, from which we can do simulations of the um, pulling the vessel, the transfer vessel up, and, and getting folks comfortable with actually making that transition from the vessel to, uh, you know, behind the surfer rails and up the ladder to, to the turbine. And uh, there are also, you know, confined space rescue, rescue from heights, rescue from depth, and um, that's all very, it's pretty technical, and we need to make sure that all of the workers are, are feeling comfortable before they uh, step foot out on, on the job. As I just mentioned, that there is no facility in the United States that actually offers uh, the sea survival, the GWO sea survival. Uh, I should mention that I have, I have seen some and talked to some different folks who, who are providing um, sea survival in a pool. And we feel, uh, from our perspective up here, we have, um, we, have, we have no desire to teach hypothermia in a bathtub full of ice cubes. We are interested in getting folks feeling what it feels like um, in Buzzard Bay in, when the water is 40 degrees so that we can do our man overboard exercises in real world conditions. Um, and, and that, again, is sort of speaking to the, the uh, transfer vessel piece where we really are uh, keen on having the real vessel there so that we can really have, you know, this is what it feels like when the current is, is flying through um, in an area where, you know, in, around Cape Cod we have, we have very strong currents and we have um, pretty dramatic tides. So there is, there's an opportunity for getting that real world training before folks get, um, get out on the boat and decide that mm, maybe this isn't for them. So here's just basically a, a synopsis of above the water training, looking at making sure that we have turbine uh, installation technicians trained, uh, operations and maintenance technicians as well, uh, back deck and below the water, as I mentioned before. So back deck workers on the back of the cable vessels, on the supply vessels, looking at uh, folks to lay the cable, ROV operators, and then health and safety clearly is an umbrella that covers all of this. Uh, for the offshore marine safety, we have the helicopter underwater egress training, uh, turbine transfer vessel, SPCW, and firefighting. Those are all particular, particularly important. So here are the first, the, the five modules, and, and the GWOC survival is, is definitely what our focus is on, um, on making sure that we have that set up so that we are ready to get, get workers, um, even what they call the the casual maritime observer <laughs> that may go out every once in a while, not, not a worker, uh, but there is still a need for some training if folks are going to be stepping foot on a vessel and um, making that transition from the quayside and, and going out to, to a turbine. Very, very important. Here's just basically an overview of let's try to pull all these up. The, uh, the training opportunities. We're looking for the uh, to the BZEE um, training modules as well as GWO BZEE. As um, as Earl showed the slide for Global Wind Organization, they have many partners. Uh, all of the major players within the, the wind industry. BZEE is a German um, curriculum which was also developed for the wind industry by the wind industry. Same players involved in that. Um, so that. We're looking to that as, as another opportunity that can give us a full six and a half month turbine technician training program. We can also do technical modules in a shorter uh, time frame for folks who are interested. Health and safety and environmental training, um, the short service employees, you have an electrician who may, may have worked on a land-based project is interested in making that transition out to the, um, out to the offshore base so we will be providing training for them. Um, Sea survival training, uh, back deck operations, and again, the supply, looking at the supply vessels, there's also a need for making sure that everybody's compliant on the OSHA side, um, as well as any other regulations that uh, would be required to go into the federal waters. Um, this is just, a, this is a, just to give folks an idea of what it might look like if you were standing on the deck of a transfer vessel and thinking about making that um, transfer over. You can see the surfer rails. This vessel was pulled up, steamed up into um, those, those two uh, 
they look like bollards, but they're, they're called surfer rails. So the, the vessel pulls up there, um, basically butts up against those as they to sort of dampen the heave of the of the waves. You can see they're using a davit crane to to take up um, up to the platform to the surface platform there. Um, any kind of equipment because you want to make sure that you, as the person making the transfer, you are not encumbered by a backpack or any kind of um, duffel of sorts that might set you off balance and, and potentially set you up for um, an accident or a fall or something along those lines. So um, we want to make sure that, that everybody is well trained and has the ability to work together well in a collaborative fashion. You can see there's a number of folks out here um, working together. Everybody has their, their suits on, their helmets. Health and safety is, is an absolute culture in the offshore environment, and, uh, and that's very important to us. Um, so I guess it's important to speak to the fact that if you are interested in working, say, on the Block Island project or with um, the Cape Wind project, uh, since those are the two projects that we have that are ready to go, uh, Fred Olsen, this is a Norwegian company, as well as Siemens, require conformance to GWO basic training. So you must have um, all five of your, your certifications. And we really see that here in New England, we, we are going to be putting this forth and, and are very excited and, and interested in collaborating with other folks from other areas that are interested in, in a replicable model or help trying to set something like this up and how do we, how do we look at what, uh, what are the skill sets that we need in order to to have good workers that are, are going to be invested in working in the offshore and land-based uh, wind sector. I think in the United States we have more experience, clearly, in the land-based sector, but um, it takes a special kind of person to work in the offshore environment. I can tell you from my personal experience a couple weeks ago, um, being in a Coast Guard cutter simulator, <laughs> so it's not, even, it's not even moving, and the visual simulation, the sensation of getting seasick totally <laughs> it's um, incapacitating. So, you know, we, we have to make sure that folks, uh, you can't be afraid of heights, and you definitely can't get seasick if you are planning on, on making this transition into the offshore wind uh, space to work. So we are, we're interested in making sure that uh, our workers are comfortable with that. This is just an overview of the BZEE, uh, which I spoke to earlier. Uh, the key piece to this is that there's a 240-hour practical internship, um, which is required before you sit for the exam, which is a practical exam as well as a written exam. And that's really important um, because we, we want to make sure that people have hands-on experience. I think, as Earl showed earlier, having folks that um, can get their hands on the actual equipment, that obviously that makes for, for a better informed, uh, better skilled, higher skilled worker, and, and that um, is important. So that's all I have for you. Just wanting to make sure that we can we can do this in a really good uh, fashion and make sure that health and safety training is, is at the top of our list of things to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you both. We will move on to Q and A and discussion in a moment. But it seems like there's a lot of training that needs to occur before we can get workers out there on small vessels working on the case key side. So it seems a bit overwhelming. How far along are we in training a U.S. workforce? Are we starting from square one, or do folks have some kind of training that's transferable from the land-based sector? I and this say, is for either of you. Oh, sure. Um, you know, from our perspective, we are looking, again, at bringing the, take, bringing the GWO, sea survival, as well as I, on a couple of my slides, I indicated we, um, we have a relationship with Guardline, and they do uh, transfer vessel training. Um, they're, you know, very specific to that. They, they also, uh, they, they license the, um, the tra they make transfer vessels themselves. So they are a multifaceted group. <laughs> Um, so really looking to the Europeans to, to bring over the, the best practices and, um, and make sure that that is something that, that our workers are exposed to and, and have the ability to, to take that experience uh, there. But, you know, from our, 
again, from our perspective, we are really interested in having um, having the trainers, the instructors, be part of our local um, resources. We have been we have we talked with various folks who are saying, you know, from the from the UK, and we'll fly over some instructors and we'll teach you folks. But that's that's not part of our overall vision. We we definitely want to make sure that that institutional knowledge stays stays here. And um, because again, we have a couple projects and then sort of a calm period. <laughs> and uh, we want to make sure that we have we have good folks that are invested in our local community, so that when we come around to having to train some more folks again, that we're not scrambling and having to reteach people. Or you know, it's really about making sure that we have consistency. And also making sure that folks understand they can also work in the land-based side of things. Definitely replicability, taking these skill sets from either offshore or onshore. And so you're talking about training to a global module or a, a global standard that various developers use. So once a U.S. workforce is trained, and you also spoke of a, a lull between projects, is this training transferable? So could those U.S. workers go to the U.K. or elsewhere in Europe to work Absolutely. on projects overseas? Absolutely. So it's a worthwhile investment for the, the future employee and, and the industry. Yeah. If I could just throw out a couple of uh, points. Uh, a, uh, the original question was uh, how, how far along are we? Well, the, the U.S. wind industry is, is not young. It's, 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 uh, it's a reasonably mature industry. It's not offshore. It's just onshore. Uh, and so we have a lot of people in the United States now that, that are, are ready to do this type of work, minus, minus the sea survival training and right. the boat transfer training. So we, we've moved along a long way in that realm. Uh, in fact, Siemens has been looking forward to the Cape Wind project for a number of years, and uh, we've been uh, sending some of uh, our American colleagues overseas to work in the offshore industry for quite some time to, to gain that knowledge and bring it back to the United States so that we have an intrinsic mass uh, in the U.S. ready to do that work. In fact, we have people from uh, the New England area that we've hired uh, a couple of years ago already uh, who are out in our land-based uh, workforce learning how these things work. So uh, uh, they'll, they'll be ready to move back. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, folks from New England, when they have to live in the Dakotas for a while, they're ready to move back to New England. <laughs> so uh, we, we have quite a few people that are, that are already ready. So you know, it won't be a huge jump. We, we won't be in the, in the, in the, uh, behind the eight ball, if you will, when we start. And, but another thing that Megan said, I, I want to address that too, is is Siemens is very, very proud of the relationships we build with community colleges and trade schools around the country. Uh, where we say that we do all this GWO training here in Orlando, that, that's accurate. But under our license, we do a lot of GWO training in other locations. Uh, one would be High Plains Technology Center in Woodward, Oklahoma. They, uh, they have trainers that we have trained that work for High Plains. Uh, that provide that GWO training up here, there. So we we want to have that uh, that uh, self-reliance, if you will, in every individual region. Uh, uh, it's probably taboo to say this, but Siemens is a for-profit company, and as a consequence, we like to do things uh, that uh, that uh, maximize our potential, such as uh, not sending people uh, back and forth to Orlando unnecessarily. So if, if we find a way to do it less expensively in the local area, that's the way we're going to do it. Because uh, right. after all, we like we're doing hard. this about climate change. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, got <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted like to add a couple of points ahead. on that. So it sounds like we're well underway, or Siemens has already started the ball rolling with the along the train, the trainer type of model. So, and you mentioned that we aren't behind the eight ball. So I'm assuming we're we're on track to have you the U.S. workforce at least some ready for the first U.S. offshore deployment. Yeah, it'll be more than some, ma'am. Uh, the, the the question generally pops up. How how many Europeans are coming over to the U.S. to do this uh, work? The answer is going to be very few. I'll, I'll go back to that for-profit statement I made. Uh, when folks come over from uh, Europe to, to work in the United States, uh, uh, we pay them quite well to do so. And I just as well not, I just as well pay another American here in the U.S. that, that, same, uh, that same money to do the work here and keep it. So we're, we're not going to use as many people off, uh, from over, over, overseas as one might believe. There will obviously be a few 
uh, experts that we're going to need for, for guidance. It's, it's silly not to take someone's advice who's been doing it for years. Uh, that's, just, that's just crazy. We're not going to do that. But by the same token, it won't be a horde of, of people coming over. It's just going to be a few select advisors, and we'll be using U.S. workforce uh, by and large. Great. Thanks for that. Let me get to some more questions from the audience. There's a question on clarification. The, uh, Megan, I believe this is for you. There was a slide in which it was mentioned the requirement to, D, to GWO and how it isn't wholly applicable to the U.S. is something we are working on harmonizing. The question is well, what and, specific activities are you engaged in and what is the ideal outcome? Oh, that's a good question, and I, I am not prepared to answer that because it's an ongoing, sort of fluid <laughs> process. Um, and again, it's, it's relating back to sort of the Boehm Bessey regulations, and and is a page and a half of regulations that um, that are there in place um, that really don't reference any kind of standard from a health and safety perspective. Uh, is that what we need? And and I think at this point. From from our perspective, looking at looking to the GWO as the as the best place to start, um, that is that's where we're at, and then making sure that we meet all of the the OSHA requirements and any other kind of legislation that is that is required. Um, that's important. But as the industry grows, there's an opportunity to um, to make some modifications. You know, one of the things that we have looked at is taking the FTCW, which is a requirement here in the United States. Um, it's very similar to, you know, it offers a, a part of sea survival, man overboard, those kinds of things. Um, and, and looking at what are the, what are the, um, the differences between the FDCW as well as, you know, up against the, the GWO sea survival. And it's clear that this GWO sea survival, that's specific to wind. And, and, um, and so if we were to create something, a different standard here in the U.S., then SGCW would have to be modified so that it would actually encompass the turbine-specific components and the vessel transfer and some of the other things that would be uh, that would be lacking in SGCW today. Thank you. You, you both touched on this a little bit, but there's, uh, if you can expand on it, there's a question from the audience. Is it the intention or is it considered critical to establish training centers beyond the two sites that now exist? What are the future plans? I mean, I, our plan is to have something here in, in Massachusetts and hopefully begin training this coming spring of 2015. Um, but there's, there's an opportunity to work with, as Earl said, you know, finding community colleges that have um, lab space and instructors that are interested in supporting this. Um, from the land base as well as the offshore piece, I think that's critical. And from my perspective, if I could get out of doing the GWO training completely, I would be okay with that. Uh, if, uh, and the reason I say that, I, I worked in, uh, in uh, human resources for quite some time hiring technicians. So we would go to a, a good school who had spent a lot of time and effort teaching these uh, young men and women how to work on a wind turbine, then I would have to take them back to our organization and retrain them again. It would have been so much more efficient if that school had trained them in the things we needed them to be trained in, then I could hire them directly. So, uh, you know, my, my vision is that, that, uh, that schools all over the Northeast are teaching GWO as part of their curricular for WIND, and when we hire them, we don't have to do anything except uh, uh, give them some semen-specific instruction, and we match them up with a, a veteran technician in the field, and they go to work. That, that's what I want. Uh, when when uh, a, a, a community college spends time to train them under a standard that we don't use, it's a, it's a waste of time for both parties. So my vision is that uh, we're all doing GWO so that we, we don't have to do that duplication of training. Mm -hmm. And until community colleges, et cetera, technical schools begin offering the right kind of training, do you see that developers will be offering the training, or is this something prospective employees would need to find on their own? I've not heard of any developers providing this training. 
the, the, the model right now is, is uh, whomever's doing the installation or doing the service provides that training. So it's really, in most cases, falling back to the OEMs. There are a few companies out there that do their own safety training, uh, but most of them fall back to the OEM for, for that training. Great. I saw in the news today or yesterday actually that a group called the G9 has released some best practice guidelines for offshore safety. How does that group compare to the GWO? Uh, so they're similar. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of, of, of groups out there working toward uh, standardization. Uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, Megan indicated there was a page and a half of regulations for wind. That's, that sounds about right. Uh, the, the, the organizations themselves are not heavily regulated right now, and, and a lot of folks are kind of scurrying for, for a position on who's going to take over that requirement. So the industry itself is trying to be uh, uh, proactive in, in coming up with, with good standards that the industry can follow. And there's a few. UK Renewables is doing it. G9's doing it. GWO's doing it. Uh, these are all groups that said, let's, let's get some good standards out there and get them adopted. In some cases, they're doing a little bit of uh, 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 jockeying for position on who's going to be the position in, or be the, the company or the organization that sets the standard. Might look at it like uh, BOMA and NFPA. They, they are not BOMA, but uh, BOCA and NFPA. They, they kind of did that for a number of years. Eventually, all these things are going to come together, and uh, there will be one standard. I, I feel pretty confident. I'm not sure exactly which one's going to win in the end, uh, but uh, right now I'm thinking GWO is the, the, the right. And, and to be honest, they're, none of them are too far off of each other. They're all very, very, very similar. Thank you. Another question, are there any special trainings or standards for floating turbines being developed or any special overseeing organizations? Well, Siemens has a floating turbine and I'm not familiar with any differences, so uh, I'd have to say the answer would be no, there's, there's no differences in the training for it, unless you know something other than that, Megan. I do not. Earl, this is a question for you. Someone is wondering uh, what Siemens' position is on the Jones Act and the cargo preference laws for offshore wind. I'm not sure if that's something you're involved in. That would be a in. great answer for somebody who worked in a supply chain, unfortunately. I, I don't have a position on it. I'm the head of training and development. I am, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it just because I was talking to the head of supply chain the other day about it, and he was spending a lot of time up in... Uh, in Washington, but to, to be honest, I, I couldn't answer that question uh, with any intelligence whatsoever, so it's best just to shut my mouth before I expose my ignorance. <laughs> All right. Let's see. There are a couple of more questions. Here's another clarification question, Megan, for you. What is the submarine cable installation that was illustrated in one of your slides? Ah, so that's each, in, when you have an array of uh, turbines out in the ocean, then you have to lay a cable from the um, there are the cables that run between the turbines, and then they go back to the electrical platform, and from the electrical platform back to a substation on shore. So all of those cables need to be trenched into uh, into the sand, and and that is that was what that was referring to. Does that help? We'll we'll see. If you have a follow-up okay. question, please feel free to type it in. <laughs> uh, just to follow up on workforce training as, and who will provide it, is there any difference in the training needs between developers and contractors and subcontractors? Uh, I can tell you no. In general, we're all looking for very similar things. Uh, for instance, Siemens, uh, when we install a wind farm, we're running about 70% of our workforce as contractors. So we're looking for those same people, those electrical and mechanical skills uh, to put, them, put the wind turbines in. Depending on the location, there's electricians, and there's, there's pipe fitters, and there's concrete layers, all these, all these people with different skills. But the ones who are doing turbine-specific stuff, it's always hydraulics and electronics, or electrics, rather. Uh, for our technicians, it's the same, uh, it's the same set of skills. Um, I, I'm personally on the, the, the board of advisors for about a half dozen community colleges across the U.S. and 
And it's always the same thing I, I, I'm focused on, the electrical systems and the hydraulic systems, and the ability to walk out of a classroom and recognize that that, uh, that panel on the wall is very similar to that electrical system they were working on in their labs a few days before. Uh, the, the students that can make that leap do quite well in the industry. Thank you. Do you, either of you see a conflict between companies and training providers advocating for standards while also providing training to meet those standards? Uh, I've been talking for a while, Megan. You want to jump in on this one for a bit? I, I mean, I would say that clearly if we don't have standards for the offshore sector that are really laid out uh, and there's, there are no training programs, really, uh, you know, in the offshore sector that are meeting any kind of, well, <laughs> um, I don't see that there's a conflict. I, as I said before, we are looking to the best practices and the, the training um, requirements that the, that the European sector work with. And, and you know, that, that's what we have to go on right now. I, I think it would be silly for us to reinvent the wheel. Um, and really wanting to make sure that we have that workers that are prepared. And, you know, there are, certain, there are certain companies that say, here's the threshold. You must have these certifications in hand in order to work for us. Um, that's, that's just the rule. And then we, have, uh, then we have specific technology that we want to expose you to. And Earl, you just spoke to that. But um, I would say, you know, there's, if, if someone is requiring a GWO, sea survival uh, and, and you have some other skills, it's, it would be sort of like, a ref, you know, in, in working in the offshore sector, it would be like a refresher to just take that and get your, um, your GWO certificate so that it would say, yes, you're, you're uh, qualified to, to make these transfers in a safe manner. Anything to add to that, Earl? Well, I think there's going to be a bit of a conflict between different companies about what they think the right safety standards are and what they're, A, willing to pay for and the risk they're willing to absorb to some degree or another. Uh, I, I think that's where some of that conflict might come in. If you look at uh, UK Renewables, for instance, that's a you know, UK organization, and uh, UK takes their safety very, very, very seriously to the point that, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, if there's a safety violation, someone could well go to jail under criminal uh, accounts, whereas in other countries in Europe, it's not quite as, uh, as stringent as that. The United States kind of fits someplace in the middle there, I think. So uh, I think GWO, personally, is a, is a good blend between uh, what we're seeing overseas and what we're, have, we're practicing in the U.S., in, in, at least from the, the, the major players uh, perspective, I think some of the smaller organizations might have a, a hard spot with some of the GWO because it would require some investment in capital and or investment in training. But, but I think that's a good thing overall. About a year or so ago, I was watching a frontline program on PBS about the cell phone industry and uh, the, the people who are climbing those towers. And uh, if you ever get a chance to see that, I, I strongly recommend it because it, it showed what could happen in an unregulated business uh, when, uh, when, you, when, when folks are, are, are not necessarily into to paying for that uh, safety program. So uh, the answer to your question, I think there is some conflict, but I think most of the big folks and the big players are the guys who are going to be working offshore. They're, they're pretty much on board. Great, thank you. Well, that wraps it up for the hour. I want to thank you both for very informative and thorough presentations and to everyone who submitted questions. There was a, a lot to discuss. I hope we answered all your questions. The, Sam, if you could advance the last slide. If anyone has follow-up questions, please feel free to contact me and I can try to answer the question or pass it on to the right person. You can learn more about the Northeast Wind Resource Center and what we're working on as far as land base and offshore wind at northeastwindcenter.org. And you can log into the Wind Exchange site 
and learn about the five other wind resource centers across the U.S. Again, many thanks to you, Earl and Megan. Thank you, Sam, for organizing us and doing the housekeeping, and a thank you to the DOE for helping to fund this resource center. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and have a good afternoon. Thanks, Sal. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.